I thought we could take a little break from our andiron project this week, and I thought we could make a hammer, and this will be a hammer that I'm going to give away as part of the 100,000 subscriber giveaway. In fact, I think we're going to make two hammers. I'll probably put one on the Etsy shop to sell and one to give away. Now to do that, I've got a piece of 4140. 4140 makes a pretty darn good hammer. And this is a piece of inch and three quarter square bars. So that's about a 45 millimeter square bar. It is eight inches long and that's 200 millimeters long. Now this is probably bigger than I really want my hammer to be profile wise. I think I'd rather have it more like inch and a half than inch and three quarter. So I'm going to draw this out before I do any layout. If I didn't have a power hammer, I think it would be way easier to just buy a piece of inch and a half 4140. It would be worth it. It would save me hours of brutal work trying to hammer this out by hand just to turn it into an inch and a half square bar. This weighs six pounds, 13 ounces. So that's two, three and a half pound hammers almost. But I guarantee you we're gonna lose a fair amount of material to scale. We're gonna lose some when we punch it. And we're gonna lose even more when we do some grinding on it. So if these end up between two and a half and three pounds, I'll be pretty happy. Now this is a two and a half pound hammer, or it used to be a two and a half pound hammer. But I've been using this for 35 years. It's been redressed many times. And it's an inch and a half square to start with. So going for that inch and a half square, I think, is the right size for a two and a half pound hammer. The, the size this is right now is really more like this big hammer that's 2,000 grams or 4.4 pounds. And I think 4.4 pounds is way too big for a giveaway hammer that might be going to a newer smith that just can't swing something this heavy. In fact, I don't swing this by hand more than a few minutes at a time, and very rarely do I even do that. Mostly I use this William Bastis hammer that's about three pounds. So if we end up between two and a half and three, I think that's a real good size hammer for most people. And I think a cross peen hammer is probably the most useful hammer in the shop. So that's what we're going to make. We're actually going to make two out of this bar. Like I say, this is enough material for two hammers. We're going to draw it out and get that final dimension that I want first. And I'm going to do that under the Samac power hammer. And then we're going to lay it out, punch the eyes on each end. Now, if you punch both eyes in the same plane, you can get two cross peen hammers. If you punch one this way and one this way, so they're 90 degrees apart, you can get a cross peen and a straight peen hammer. I'm going to go for two cross peens because, like I say, I think those are the most useful hammers. So the first step is going to be to draw this out and redimension the stock, get it down to an inch and a half square, and then we'll go on and make the hammers. I suspect this will be at least a two or a three part video. And that's just because after the forging, I let it anneal overnight. And I won't finish it today, but I would like to finish the video today. So whatever we get done today, we'll make into one video. Then we pick it up again, we'll start a second video. And if it doesn't get done in time for next Wednesday, then we'll do the final steps as a third video. And we won't do that giveaway until the hammer's finished.
here's our piece we were working on. It's now 10 inches long. So I'm going to go right to the center on each side, which would be two and a half inches. Those rulers have a little bit of a plastic coating on them, so they do smoke if you get them too hot. I'm going to put a nice deep center punch mark in at two and a half inches. Make it centered side to side. This is where we're going to punch our hole. I want to mark both sides of the, the billet here. So I can punch part way from each side. marks off you try to straighten it quick once you've hit it a couple of times you're probably not going to get it to straighten out that looks better so that's something we can then find when we come in hot under the power hammer we should be able to see those nice deep punch marks on both sides And for a punch, I'm going to use this punch, which is a round punch. It's about three quarters of an inch diameter, tapers to an inch. And for those who haven't seen this before, a round punch will result in an oval eye. And you'll just have to watch and see how the material behaves and why a round punch makes a nice oval hammer eye. This punch is made out of Atlantic 33 or the Flutagon, which is a water hardening, self tempering steel. So if this punch gets red hot under the hammer, I can just throw it in a bucket of water, go right back to using it. Don't have to worry about tempering it or destroying it. And it's a really good tool for these hot punches under the power hammer.
Well, these hammers really aren't going as smoothly as I had hoped they were. They've definitely got some issues. I think they're salvageable, but I don't make a whole lot of hammers. And since I'm still learning to punch holes under the same Mac instead of doing it the way I used to by hand, it's a lot faster under the same Mac, but it'll screw things up a lot faster than doing it by hand. So things are going a little rough. The eyes are not perfectly straight and there's a little bit of rag in there that I would just as soon not have because the punch didn't share out right. They aren't terrible, but they aren't great. And they're a little bit thin through here. That's something I wasn't really going for. So they're going to need a little bit more work. We're going to do a little bit now, but a lot of it will happen later. And I think they're just a little out of proportion. So we're going to see what the weight ends up being and see what they need. But we'll clean up the peens here at the anvil first, and then we'll worry about the rest of it probably in another video. And certainly this sort of thing happens. It's not unusual to screw things up and get things off center. And frequently the solution is just to get a fresh piece of material and start over. And that could still happen with these. It's largely, like I say, a matter of need more practice under the power hammer. And if you'd like to see somebody that really knows how to make hammers under a power hammer, Take a look at Brent Bailey's videos. I'll find one that really shows how he does this under a power hammer. I'll link it right up here. He is the master at doing these. He does them in a couple of heats. They're clean, they're neat, but he's done hundreds and hundreds of hammers. And his 250 pound little giant has just a little bit more wallop to it than the same Mac does. But let's refine the, the peen a little bit and just try to flatten this out. Tongs made just to fit these would help as well. We've got this antique pair of hammer eye tongs that is just huge. Let me see if we can make this fit. These are probably good for sledgehammers. And for all I know, they came out of a shop making sledgehammers. I don't know. That's always a possibility. Those will be a little bit better. Go to the vise and spread the reins out just a little. Yeah, that'll be better. These peens are a little bit on the long side, I think. These hammers ended up longer and skinnier than I intended, and that's okay. I can always cut that off, grind it to shape. I do like a thicker peen. It's thicker in this dimension than I do a skinnier one. I think it performs better. Most of the cleanup of the eye, on the other hand, I think will occur with a die grinder. And I'll show you a little of that in the next video. And of course that doesn't reach. So I'm going to have to go clean that up. I'm going to smooth the peen on both of these hammers. And this can be done under the power hammer with a flatter. But I know you guys like to see me work at the anvil. There's not much to do on this end. I just want to put a little bevel on here to 
make a slightly smaller face than the bulk of the hammer shows. I think there's going to be some more forging on these. This will not be the final forging, even though I wish it was. And I want to clean the eyes up on these before I finish the forging step. Yeah, this one, the peen's just a little bit longer, hard to fit back in the eye. This is a bucket of vermiculite and that will let them cool very slowly so they'll be softer and easier to file and grind. Now just in case you haven't figured it out, I am not as thrilled with today's project as I would like to be. They are going to be successful hammers, they will be 100% useful, and I think in the long run they're going to look pretty good. Unfortunately, in the long run is going to be longer than it should have been if things had gone smoothly and cleanly. And as I said, that's largely because I don't make enough hand hammers this way. I don't punch enough eyes under the power hammer. And this is a real good argument for Francis Whitaker's method of making a hammer eye where he drills two holes at the ends of the eye. So, that's, so that matches either end of the hammer handle here. And that just leaves a little thin web in the middle that has to be punched out. That almost always guarantees your eye is straight, centered, and symmetrical from left to right of the hammer, as long as you lay out for the holes you're going to drill just right. But for now, I'm going to leave these in that bucket of vermiculite to cool. The vermiculite insulates them. They cool very slowly. That makes them softer. They're easier to file or grind. In my case, I think I'm probably going to use a die grinder to get inside that eye and try and clean it up. Not really all that hard, but it's just time I'd rather not spend. And of course, it uses tools that you don't have to have if you get it right the first time. So taking the time to lay it out and drill those holes and punch the web out, which goes really fast and is way easier to do at the anvil, you don't need a power hammer at that point, really is a pretty good way to go in my book. But again, if you want to see somebody that really knows how to do this under a power hammer or even by hand, Watch some videos from Brent Bailey. He is the master making hammers. Matter of fact, if you can afford to buy a hammer from another blacksmith, Brent's hammers are pretty darn nice. So we'll pick this up next week with cleaning up that eye. Then we'll probably do a little bit more forging. Then there'll probably be at least one more video to do the heat treating on it because I won't be able to do that. They'll need to normalize and anneal after doing all the grinding or whatever other forging I want to do. And we'll explain why that needs to be done in the next video because I need the hammer to show you what the irregularities are that I saw while I was forging them. Most of you probably saw that already, but we'll take a closer look at them at the beginning of the next video. We'll try to correct all those problems in the next video. Third video, hardening, tempering, and if time allows, I can let them sit for a day, come back the next day, put the handle on and include that part in the third video because really putting the handle on isn't that big a deal. In any case, I do hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.